I'm Pat Gunn, and these are my thoughts on the United Nations. I made this video because I hear a lot of uh, conversations about the role of the United Nations in world politics, and I see a lot of criticism vocalized uh, without a lot of support. And this isn't intrinsically a problem in that, in theory, it would be nice if people look for solid arguments on each side before they make decisions or reach conclusions, or at least if they, if they dig around looking for facts. But when you see lopsided enough um, uh, coverage or expression of opinion on something, then there's the danger of ideas about it moving in ways that they probably that are under justified by the data and the arguments at hand. So I, I think that it's helpful to have people who are not particularly radical, <coughs> let's see, who are, who are not particularly radical um, looking for why, uh, looking for why you might want to support something or not support something. And so th this is largely the sum of my thoughts about the uh, about the United Nations, what it's trying to do, how it's structured, things like that, just to offer what is probably a, a pretty moderate, uh, fer a fairly supportive perspective, uh, while while hopefully not being uh, not not uh, seeing it through rose cl uh, colored glasses. So the United Nations, as you might remember, was founded as a kind of successor to the League of Nations. The League of Nations having been founded after World War I as an attempt to prevent that kind of war from happening again. Clearly it didn't work out that well. And its failure was apparent even before the events leading up to the upbringing of World War II. And so the United Nations was formed with a somewhat uh, or with a significantly different structure and with some, uh, somewhat different goals. If you're interested, the history of the League of Nations is interesting. It's worth, uh, worth looking up. But there's still the, the primary goal of the United Nations is to prevent wars. And there's a lot of other things it does. There are other things that it's trying to do, some of which help it with that primi uh, primary objective, and some of which are other goals that just kind of snuck in there. But it, it uh, for example, it, it provides a convenient way to rally around causes, uh, to preserve heritage sites, uh, things like that. And the way that this works is that it acts as a kind of society uh, where nations care about their reputation and they believe that opinions that are outside of those that they can control within their borders, whether through state-controlled media or uh, cultural advocacy, there are various ways that nations uh, have different uh, ways of looking at the world. But the idea that perspectives that are outside the way that you look uh, at the world, they're things that you're going to listen to, they're things that you're going to care about, and the United Nations, it provides a forum where people will debate any anything that comes to mind. They'll they'll discuss things. They'll dis discuss uh, discuss the conduct of other nations, and by providing that, they allow for nations to become PR conscious, which isn't the same thing as actually caring about ethics and any kind of universalist sense. But they do have to care about what uh, about things that the other nations say about them, or at least they get in the habit of doing so, and hopefully through that habit they begin to care. And the, the rallying about causes also happens through that primary mechanism. You provide a place for people to talk, and they'll defend themselves, and they'll realize that they're going to have to defend themselves against things. And this it's not entirely effective at preventing them from doing atrocities or waging war. Um, but it makes it a little bit harder, and that is probably a desirable thing. Um, and this brings us to one of the primary ten uh, primary tensions in the United Nations in terms of how it's structured and how it's uh, how it functions, and that's inclusion versus ideals. 
uh, the United Nations, in order to do its job of making war uh, a lot less likely, uh, it, it needs to bring as many nations of the world together into its forums as it can. And it needs uh, them to feel fairly vested in their participation in the United Nations. And uh, that means, given the, the great diversity of perspectives that nations have, again, remember that this is nations, it's not peoples, although to a large extent nations shape the perspectives of people, uh, peoples and vice versa. But nations need to have a strong justification to participate. And yet, you, uh, it would also be nice if the United Nations had a, uh, if it had a, a mechanism, uh, or if it had mechanisms to raise the standards of discourse, uh, to, to improve moral outcomes, things of that sort. And that's the pull towards idealism. And the United Nations exists along this tension. It's a significant tension in how it does things between wanting to include everything and wanting to have some ideals. And this is why you see things that are bad PR for the United Nations itself, like having rights abusers uh, uh, rotating into human rights committees. And this has happened several times. It, it almost always makes the news. There's almost always a certain amount of anger uh, particularly in the West, when you see nations that have done genocide, that uh, don't have significant freedom of speech, uh, ethnic homelands, uh, uh, just other highly undesirable things. When you have nations that are doing that, and they're, they're on the Rights Council for a while. But this, although this is a valid criticism, it doesn't damn the effort. Again, because you need to, uh, to get people to the table even if you uh, even if you would like them to behave differently, and they're not going to just show up uh, to be insulted. Um, there are also some unusual things uh, in the structure of the United Nations relating to how it started, and the UN Security Council is uh, is an unusual uh, it's an unusual feature in this regard. Now, this is something which the West broadly appreciates, but a lot of the rest of the world, probably rightly, is not happy about, that the most powerful nations combined with uh, traditional Western nations have permanent seats on the UN Security Council, and they have the ability to override a lot of the General Assembly. I, I could not justify this in terms of a... Uh, in t fully in terms of inclusion versus ideals, because there's also a, a kind of third hidden concern that fits into this, uh, which is that powerful nations have the ability to shape world politics much more than smaller nations do. And so even though the, uh, the, the UN broadly is a lot like the United States Senate, and that it's designed to give a lot of representation to states as individual units and one large state is not going to be able to override smaller states. Um, but, but there's the recognition in the UN Security Council that power also matters. And to a certain extent that history also matters and that there are some European powers that are no longer uh, so dramatically uh, more powerful than uh, than the rest of the world that uh, that their uh, their veto power on the rest of the UN, UN is still justified it, it probably isn't but um, but th this it, it's part of that tension and it pulls against both of both of the other intuitions that are at play inclusion and ideals uh, so there's there's power in there as well and there's there are also unusual things uh, well, there are there are features of the United Nations where smaller nations that uh, that are unpopular for one reason or another typically end up being beat up a lot because that that kind of um, that that kind of uh, criticism is often warranted, but it's also often either exaggerated or in some cases fabricated. Um, because opposition to certain groups and nations has become part of the culture uh, 
of certain nations, and it often extends beyond the strictly justified. And so there's, pro uh, so while I would not want to defend uh, Israel in, in the broadest sense and everything that they do, I think that they're in many ways a, a despicable nation because they're aiming to be an ethnic homeland. And I, I think that any ethnic homeland is to be criticized. Uh, it's, uh, it's not a healthy thing to try to be. And it uh, typically raises one ethnicity over another. Uh, but a lot of their neighbors are also worthy uh, of the exact same criticisms. And the, the ways in which their neighbors have used Israel as a punching bag while it might be justified uh, when you look at it in the absolute sense, like what did Israel do, it's not uh, as strongly justified when you also consider are the nations criticizing it for these things doing the exact same things or doing something that is of comparable uh, uh, problematic, uh, something that's comparably uh, problematic. And so in that sense, you see a lot of the institutions of, of, uh, of the United Nations pulled against certain actors that are unpopular for one reason or another. And again, I, I would not want to excuse them for having done the things in, in the broadest sense that made them unpopular. Sometimes this is justified, sometimes it's not. But, uh, but it often departs from fairness or the strictly justified when you consider uh, concerns of, uh, of the actions of the criticizers. Now, there, there are questions of, is the UN sized well for its mission? And, uh, and some of this might differ depending on whether we're talking about its current role or possible future roles that the United Nations might take. In that some people, uh, some international actors and some uh, at, and some talking heads would like to see the UN fill the role of being a kind of supranational governance. And so they would like to strengthen UN institutions, make them more government-like, uh, and others see the United Nations as being primarily about preventing war. And I can see the appeal of, of both of those arguments, although I, I tend to lean a little more towards skepticism um, given all of the tensions that are at play in the United Nations, and I suspect that its current structure is not well suited towards uh, acting as a supranational governance. And in particular, there are causes that I care deeply about that are part of American governance, uh, such as a nearly absolute free speech, both as a governmental norm and as a societal norm, Whereas a number of other nations have relig uh, religiosity built into their fabric, and they've been pushing the United Nations to have uh, have to condemn blasphemy, uh, to condemn other types of speech that in the United Nation uh, or in the United States we see as acceptable, and as a uh, as a cost that we're willing to pay uh, to pay as part of a um, part of a free society. I know that freedom is one of those words that means very different things to, to different people, and some people might also question how important is freedom. But my point here isn't to dig deep into that debate, but simply to note that I have commitments ideologically that I think that the United Nations is hostile to, and I would be wary of seeing the United States cede sovereignty on these topics. Um, to the United Nations. I would not accept uh, a loss to free speech um, because of the religious uh, or, or other concerns of some nations. A number of nations have les majest laws um, where it's illegal to criticize their monarch and they revere their monarch and uh, people are tossed in jail for saying like the king is a fink or something like that. Um, but on certain topics, perhaps supranational governments, uh, governance is more desirable. Um, if, for example, we felt that th there are certain concerns where we can reason uh, reasonably agree, I think, that we live on one planet, 
and certain types of actions, uh, uh, they flow beyond state borders, um, things like pollution. And if we were to push a certain amount of that kind of governance th to the United Nations to limit pollution and ideally ensure the survival of our biosphere, things like that, I could, I could potentially get behind that. Uh, although I wouldn't allow that to be used in, uh, as an excuse to extend your uh, UN jurisdiction uh, in the super governance model onto uh, onto other topics where I think that we don't uh, different nations don't need to see things the same way. And uh, there are there are also concerns about whether the cultural programs uh, that we see that the United Nations do. Uh, there are uh, World Heritage Sites, for example. Are those a distraction from the primary goal? Do they exist without competing with the primary goal? And does their potential uh, criticism not diminish the, UN's, uh, the UN as a whole and its uh, role in avoiding war or not? And I, I don't have an answer to a lot of these questions. Some of them are questions where I would have to judge a situation uh, given all of the details rather than reach a blanket judgment. But as a whole, I believe that the role in, uh, in trying to avoid war is a worthwhile one. And I feel that the United Nations, uh, because of its establishment of a society where nations get in the habit of arguing with each other uh, as and uh, and they get in the habit of thinking about justification, I think that it, that does a really good job at preventing uh, uh, many wars that don't need to happen. Um, I, I would not give a blank check to the United Nations in terms of everything it does, but, but I think overall its role is positive, and I appreciate what they do. Uh, I think that they merit funding. I think that they increase the, the welfare of humanity. And while I don't think that human flourishing, for, uh, for example, is the only worthwhile thing to pursue, um, I think that war is often so destructive to most other ends that the vast majority of the time it should be prevented. Now, there are times when certain international norms uh, that nations need for security, they're violated. And in those cases, uh, wars might be justified when nations grab land from each other, when they steal resources on a very large scale uh, from each other, uh, things like that. Or if they pose existential threats in, in the scientific sense or, or in, in other senses to each other, then in those cases, perhaps war is necessary. But in the general sense, I think it's a disaster when it happens, and uh, and so its prevention, uh, or at least its diminishment in terms of likelihood and severity, is, is for the for the best. And so I think the UN does a good job at that. It doesn't mean that I couldn't imagine some other organization with a better structure, uh, or with a different structure, doing the job better. But I don't know what that would look like, and I wouldn't want to toss aside the United Nations of now for an uncertain future United Nations. So that's that's why I, I appreciate the United Nations. I should note that uh, some of their cultural heritage programs, like the preservation of sites very meaningful to humanity, I also see as being important goals. Uh, and I appreciate what's done there. Not always, but, uh, but often. So I'm, I'm not meaning to suggest that, they're the, that the only reason I, I like the UN is the prevention of war. But to me, that as a, um, as a primary role, uh, I, uh, I, appreciate, uh, I appreciate their advancement of, of that role, or, or, or of that goal, rather. So um, that's, that's what I have to say about this. Um, if you have any comments, uh, leave them and perhaps we'll engage on them. Bye.